The last episode wrapped up with us finally starting the new engine in the 280Z. Here we're going to continue right where that left off, the first night with the engine running, trying to sort out the high idle and the runaway throttle. I sure hope the neighbors don't mind the open headers at 10 o'clock at night, so the first of the problems was the runaway RPM. touch the throttle or even mess with the vacuum signal, the RPMs would shoot up, stopping around maybe 3,000. It like, idles fine, and then you touch the throttle, it's boom! Yeah. The second issue was that no matter what we did, we could not get the idle below maybe 15 or 1600 RPM. We messed with the idle speed screw in the throttle body, you could turn it all the way in, and the engine would still run at a high idle. The engine would not start with that screw all the way in, but it would run just fine if you screwed it in while it was running. Then we checked the timing, keeping everything conservative, but find no problems there. We made sure the throttle wasn't physically sticking and that it was closing all the way. Then we checked the fuel pressure with an inline gauge. It ran somewhere around 32 psi at our high idle. We checked various vacuum ports and looked for a leak. Removed everything we could and plugged everything we could. While running through the vacuum components, I pulled the vacuum line off of the fuel pressure regulator. That's gas spraying and dripping out of the fuel pressure regulator. So the vacuum line hooked up to that would be sucking extra fuel into the intake. That's not helping anything. That's gonna be our first order of parts to replace. We end up with this cheap, universal, vacuum referenced fuel pressure regulator. Of course, with no packaging, no instructions, and just a generic cheesy bracket. We remove the old fuel pressure regulator from its very stuck fuel hoses. We tried to fit the universal regulator in the stock location on top of the engine, but it wasn't happening. Even if we got it to clear everything else, it was going to hit the hood. So we ran a straight hose where the factory regulator was installed, and bolted the new one to the inside of the fender using existing bolt holes and a modified bracket. This regulator has a built-in fuel gauge, but I don't quite trust it. So for testing, we left the other gauge in line for comparison. The inlet hose for the new fuel pressure regulator is attached directly to the hard fuel lines running underneath the vehicle. The outlet hose is attached to the inlet line for the fuel rail. On a dry test with just the pump running, the pressures look good. We adjust the fuel pressure with the engine running to around 32 or 34 psi, which is as far as we can tell what the vacuum referenced fuel pressure should be at about this RPM. Next we checked engine vacuum. It seems good considering the engine speed and age of this engine. We checked vacuum pressure and messed with the fuel pressure for a while, tried some other throttle body adjustments, and got the idle speed down a little bit, but it's still far higher than it should be. Now, I should point out that this was a very hot day, and we were standing in the driveway running this engine that still doesn't have a radiator fan. And then I noticed some vapor coming out of the radiator cap. Just stand away from it. I saw a little bit of vapor coming out of it. Forgot about that. Well, it did go out into the overflow tank. Did it? <laughs> yeah, there's hey. stuff in there. And on the ground. Sorry. There was assuredly still some air in the coolant system, so I don't think the engine got quite as hot as it might look like it got. But maybe that's just wishful thinking. We're gonna let this thing cool down and come back to it the next day. Oh yeah, that's cool. Ow. That's hot. Now that everything's cooled down, we're gonna look over everything and for the first time, move it more than just reversing it out of the garage.
reverse and first gear seem to work just fine. Worth mentioning, this car is still running open headers, so it is loud. At least there doesn't seem to be immediate damage from the overheating, but still no change in the engine. After some searching, and even tips from viewers, we learned it might be related to the BCDD, the Boost Control Deceleration Device. Apparently these get dirty, and can leak, and let air in behind the throttle butterfly, and can cause all sorts of weird issues. Yeah, it's in great shape. Hey, what, is that oily? What is the, the whip? No idea how it works. So we're removing it. it confuses you, Gary. At least for testing, the easiest thing to do is going to be completely blocking that off. So we cut a gasket and a little steel plate and bolted that on. We also tried the adjustment screw on the mass airflow sensor, but we didn't seem to get anywhere with it, so we put it back to the stock position. Next up, before we do more testing, let's put those radiator fans on. You mount them with these basically zip tie clamps that you poke through the radiator fins. <laughs> Hear the fins, the crinkle tinkle thing. It seems solid enough, we just hope it won't damage the radiator. We switch the fans from push instead of pull to leave more space behind the radiator. We also upgraded the coolant overflow to a specialty higher capacity unit. So even though the fans are mounted, they're not actually wired up yet. We're going to do a bit more testing but staying very cautious of the heat. We messed with the idle speed screw in the throttle body a bit more and got the idle even lower, but it's still very high. But other than the idle, the engine seems to run well. So for now, we're going to move on to other concerns. The previous owner installed a few of the polyurethane components from the suspension kit, but not in most of them. So we're going to go over the suspension, check out the bushings, and replace everything we can. In addition to the bushings, we have new steering rack boots, lower ball joints, and tie rod ends to install. It's, it's, a, it's a good amount of play. Do that. That's uh, that's extensive. The rubber wasn't actually connected anymore. When it came time to knock the sleeves out of the arm, it gave us a hell of a time. In the end, I just mangled it with the air chisel until it came out of there. Then we cleaned up the bores, greased everything, and pressed the new bushings in. Then we went to install the new steering rack boots. We realized, well, they didn't fit. The outer end fit right, but the inner end was much too large for the steering rack. But nothing some clever application of zip ties couldn't solve. I carefully strung together three in a triangular pattern, and it made a very secure connection. Now, how about some seats? Up until now, Sean has been sitting on a cardboard box to drive this thing. The only stock seat we have is the passenger side one. The other seat is the aftermarket racing seat and it was never attached properly to the floor. In order to really drive this thing, we need to have a seat securely attached to the floor. We tried just installing the passenger side seat on the driver's side. We messed with it a bit, but it wasn't going to happen short of removing the entire seat back. Whoa. Yeah, like bolts. It's a countersunk Ooh, block washer. <laughs> Everybody loves money and slime. <laughs> if someone can tell us what the seat material is, I'd love to know. It's almost like straw or something in there beneath the foam layer. While I got to work on trying to figure out a seat bracket to mount the racing seat to the floor properly, Sean elected to replace the rear wheel cylinders. Always undo brake lines with an open-ended red. Make sure the nut is as round as possible. If it doesn't come out, just pull it really hard. Yeah. Usually that works. It was easy enough, and the brake hardware didn't even have to come off. That fluid, though. Ooh. The new wheel cylinders popped right in and bolted right up. What's that? that bolt that's like halfway in? What is that? Look where? <laughs> On the suspension. Oh, that's a good question, Mike. <laughs> what is that? I don't know. 
I think this is a nut too. Oh, yeah, this is a nut. Well, the other one is Titan. Fantastic. When it's this hot out, upwards of 95 degrees Fahrenheit, you gotta do what you can to stay cool. I dug out these brackets that were 3 sixteenths of an inch thick and seemed to be about the right size to mount the racing seat onto the stock seat rails. I don't want to do the other side. What's that big hole under the seat? What is that? By reusing the seat rails, we also get to maintain the stock style seat adjustment. In fact, the spacing of the bolt holes in these brackets is kind of uncanny. I need to lengthen them a bit, but it'll actually fit with the holes that are already on there. So I measured everything up and devised a plan to make these brackets. The bolt holes in the floor that are supposed to be for the seat bolts were not in good shape. I had to run a tap through two of them to even get bolts in, and one of the others had a bolt broken off in it. So, the next day, we get to work. We don't let a little bit of rain get in the way. Although I tried to tell Sean he probably shouldn't be running all these wires in the rain. He's wiring up the radiator fans as I work on the seat brackets. Relay coil is all set up. And then I just need to power. Here's the battery tie down we got installed. It holds the battery reasonably tight, but I don't love it. Here's the front piece of the bracket welded up. Here's the back piece going to get this half inch tube for reinforcement. Okay, what did I do? <sighs> and the big moment? And just like that, it's got fans. I tested the brackets to make sure everything seems strong enough for the autocross racing that Sean wants to do in this car. He even installed new headlight wiring in place of the damaged stock loom. Headlights, radiator fans, nothing, fuel pump. Nice. Fuel pump is so angry, so loud. The seat bolt holes are destroyed. I tried using a drill and a tap, it wasn't happening. What we're gonna do is just use the hole that's already in the seat and tighten a nut on the other side of the bolt. And there's the brackets bolted onto the rails from the passenger side seat. First test fit. That is all the way back. It wouldn't go back much further than that. First test sit. Oh no, it's... It should be the same height as the stock seat. It's a definitely a small car. It's not terrible, but even with the stock seat height, it's still too high for Sean to sit in with the racing helmet on. So I'll modify the brackets to lower the seat as much as possible. But even with the seat like that, it's much closer to being a drivable car. Your brake fluid is supposed to look like diarrhea. I did bend it a little. I'll bend it back, don't worry. 